everyone and welcome. My name is Barb Cochran. I'm the director of the Deternier Center for Healthy Aging um, here in the School of Nursing. Today I'm representing the Northwest Geriatric Education Workforce Enhancement Center, sorry, um, which is sponsoring this lecture series. And today we have one of our um, long-term officials with the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center and um, an expert in sleep disorders in older adults. So I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. Michael Vitiello. He's a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Medicine. Uh, he's a psychologist, has a long and productive research career in sleep in older adults. Um, and he is also co-director for the Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center and has held that position or a similar one with the Northwest Geriatric Education Center. Hence since, the outdated slide. <laughs> since the mid-1980s, I believe. Not bad. Yeah. So um, you're getting one of our very, very experienced and knowledgeable faculty who's going to be speaking to you today about effective treatment of sleep disorders in older adults. Welcome. Thank you, Barbara. Or hi again, Michael. Indeed. Thank you. And uh, hello to everyone out there in our multi-state catchment area. Um, let's get to business. What I'd like to do today is provide you with an overview of the causes of sleep disturbance in older adults, and then also provide you with a very brief description of appropriate treatment strategies for these various difficulties. Um, I could spend a full lecture on each of the sleep disorders. Um, I could do a course, a full quarter's course on this, and I wouldn't cover it in true justice, but this is to give you the 10,000 foot uh, overview. To uh, Start things off, I'm going to learn how to advance the slides. All right, I got to do this, I guess. I'm going to give you two references, two citations. I was involved in both of these papers. Uh, this was published in uh, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society a few years ago. Now it was a comprehensive um, systematic analysis of the literature to come up with evidence-based recommendations for uh, assessment and management of sleep in older adults. And uh, it's a rather large, again, comprehensive document where we went into the background and significance, did general uh, review of sleep and made recommendations which were uh, based on the literature and expert evaluation of the literature. Uh, we looked at insomnia, sleep apnea, restless legs, circadian rhythm disorders, parasomnias, and hypersomnias, and we also looked at sleep disorders in long-term care settings, which is a particular part of sleep and aging which has its own uh, cadre of literature. So based on that, we made these evidence-based recommendations, and uh, if any of you want to go deeper into sleep disorders, I would suggest you uh, pursue that particular resource. Another more recent, uh, shorter paper, which I did just last year with a colleague from Penn, uh, addresses many of the same things, uh, but focuses specifically on sleep apnea and, <clears throat> and insomnia, because those are the two most common diagnoses in older adults. Uh, so both of these I think you'd find as useful references if you'd like, and uh, if you truly pay some attention to them. You don't have to listen to anything else I say for the rest of the lecture. So I want to start off with the causes of sleep disturbance and aging because they are many. And any older adult uh, probably experienced, experiences at least some uh, sleep change over time. Uh, there is such a thing as age-related sleep change. That is, if you look at just healthy, the healthiest of older adults across the life, lifespan, you see that sleep does change considerably uh, from younger age groups. And that's independent of any illnesses that we can tell. It's simply a matter of the brain maturing over time and how sleep and circadian rhythms express themselves in the aging brain. And that does involve uh, changes in the circadian timing of sleep and also a lightening of sleep and uh, considerably more wakefulness but uh, not to any pathological level. And indeed, there are a lot of older adults that are sleeping uh, in ways that they feel are quite satisfactory for the quality of their lives and don't complain of sleep disorders. And in fact, 
Um, the standard epidemiological findings are that 50% of older adults complain of significant sleep disturbance on a regular basis. And I use that to justify my research. But you have to recognize that that also says that 50% of older adults don't complain of significant sleep disturbance. So there are a lot of older adults out there uh, that are sleeping at least uh, well enough for them to feel that they're doing well and not bringing it to anyone's attention. Uh, now, as healthcare providers, you're probably less likely to meet those, uh, but you do have to recognize that. Then there are also there's the impact of comorbid medical and psychiatric illnesses. Uh, depression, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular illness, uh, COPD, pain syndromes, all of these can have a direct impact on sleep. Uh, indeed, not just these disorders, but very often the treatments that are involved in, uh, in treating these disorders can also have potential impacts on sleep. There's also primary sleep disorders, and I'll spend some time on those today. The disorders of sleep per se like obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, uh, REM behavior disorder, uh, circadian rhythm disorders that are unique disturbances in sleep not affecting other uh, body systems uh, and that may be present in an older adult. Uh, there's also something called poor sleep hygiene or poor sleep habits. All of us have rituals, ways of being, ways of behaving, uh, ways of living that can impact our sleep for the good or the bad. Um, and that could involve whether you exercise or not, uh, what your diet is like, uh, whether you nap or not, uh, what's your sleeping environment like, what's the timing of your sleep, uh, are you erratic or are you regular? All of those are rolled into something that I'll spend some time on during the lecture called sleep hygiene or sleep habits. And there are a lot of things that you can do wrong that can have significant impact on sleep and on daytime function. And then, of course, there's the all of the above, all of these. So a given individual could have, for example, 80-year-old person could have some age-related sleep change. They could have osteoarthritis pain and be mildly depressed. They might have um, a primary sleep disorder as well, and they could have poor or good sleep hygiene. And that package may be the reason that their sleep is poor, may be the reason that they're complaining about their sleep, may be the reason that they mention it to a healthcare worker. So you have to be aware of that. So what are the consequences of sleep disturbance? It's not just that sleep disturbed, but it's what happens to people's function that's really a question. What happens to their daytime ability to function? Uh, sleep disturbance typically results in excessive intrusive daytime sleepiness, so you're, falling, you're feeling tired or sleepy or falling asleep at inappropriate times. Uh, that can increase risk of accidents and falls. People can have impaired mood. They're a little grumpier or a little more uh, emotional when they're sleep deprived or sleep disturbed. Uh, you can also have problems with cognitive functioning. That includes difficulty with vigilance, maintaining attention on task. It can interfere with memory, and indeed it can also result in impaired problem solving. In fact, there's quite a bit of literature that sleep is intimately involved with good memory function and with the ability to problem solve and perform higher functions. And indeed, the higher executive cognitive functions like sequencing, paying attention, making choices between things are some of the first to go with significant sleep deprivation. And that's what happens when you have a sleep disturbance over time. Your sleep is in deficit. But it's not just those things that we typically associate with sleep disturbance, the things that make sense to us, that yes, it impacts our daily life. But there's emerging literature that long-term sleep disturbance can be possible pathways to various illnesses. That having disturbed sleep can be a risk factor or a moderating factor for a variety of illnesses. Uh, sleep apnea, for example, has been linked with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, stroke. Uh, sleep duration and restricted sleep over time has been associated now in many, many studies with uh, increased likelihood of metabolic syndrome and possibly developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, insomnia is closely linked with depression. And in fact, there have been more than 10, probably 12, pr 
prospective epidemiological studies that have demonstrated that insomnia is a major risk factor for development of depression. It's not simply a symptom of depression, but insomnia per se can lead to depression or increased risk for depression appearing at least. It's also been associated in alcohol relapse and indeed sleep disturbance like insomnia may exacerbate pain syndromes, may make pain syndromes worse. So you become even more sensitive to pain. So there's a lot of emerging literature that says insomnia and other disturbances of sleep can contribute directly to other medical and psychiatric disorders. So it's not just about being compromised in your function the next day. Your very health depends greatly on the quality of your sleep. Okay. Well, I already mentioned this before. When you look at epidemiological studies, they typically report that 40 to 50% of older adults complain of significant and chronic sleep disturbance. But again, it's important to remember that the other half don't. Despite that lack of complaint, though, there's clear evidence that the sleep of these non-complainers has changed significantly with advancing age. That's that age-related sleep change that I told you about. What are the implications of simply age-related sleep change. Somebody comes in unhappy with their sleep, but as far as uh, the healthcare worker can tell, all that's going on is the fact that they're older than they were. Well, education is probably key there. Uh, one of the things that I use is this analogy I ask when I go out speaking to groups of older adults, very often in uh, social settings or at uh, retirement homes. I ask, all right, who runs the 100-yard dash as quickly as they did when they were 16? And I don't get many people raising their hands. Actually, I've never had anybody raise their hand, which is good. One day I will. Somebody will claim, well, all right. And then I'll have to talk around the issue. But for the most part, we understand that physiologically, even if we're very healthy with age, that things change, that our muscle mass changes, that our body becomes less elastic, that our uh, ability to respire efficiently all decline with age, independent of pathology and that can compromise our physical abilities. Yet sleep, for some reason, doesn't count as a physical ability. People think of it as a constitutional right. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. Well, it doesn't work that way. And so sometimes when you put it in this context, people can appreciate more that tissue changes, even if you can't see the tissue and it's in here. And tissue over time has an impact on function, including sleep. I mentioned sleep disturbance uh, in the presence of comorbid illnesses. Both acute and chronic illnesses increase in frequency with age. And sleep can be adversely affected directly by the illness per se, indirectly by the consequences and treatments for the illness, like medications, for example, uh, like surgery, um, like bed rest. If you want to compromise someone's quality of sleep, one of the best ways you can do it is Leave them in bed, bed rest them. I can take teenagers with the most robust sleep rhythms, and if I bed rest them for four or five days, their sleep rhythms go all to hell. So you take someone who's more compromised with that or with less sleep drive than you know a, a healthy 18-year-old, uh, and you can see where that could have impact. Inactivity interacts with sleep and sleep quality. Well, how do you deal with sleep disturbance in the face of comorbid illnesses? This is an example of how our thinking has changed over time. And in fact, if you look back at my writings in the 90s, uh, I espoused the previous wisdom. And indeed, most people said, well, in the face of a comorbid illness, the sleep disturbance is probably secondary. And so, you should treat the primary illness, whether it's depression or pain or whatever, and the sleep should improve because it's secondary. But what we've learned is that sleep is not really always just a symptom. It's not simply secondary. And in fact, the whole idea of secondary insomnia is no longer part of our diagnostic lexicon. We use insomnia. And indeed, insomnia can be comorbid with other illnesses. And indeed, we've also learned that not only should you treat both the sleep disorder and the comorbid illness, 
but that effectively treating the sleep may have beneficial impact on the comorbid illness. So there's reason to treat the sleep disturbance independent because you may be improving the comorbid illness. And that's been demonstrated in quite a variety of disorders, including pain syndromes and a number of psychiatric syndromes and even some medical syndromes. Okay, let's turn now, that's kind of age-related sleep change and aspects of it, and then sleep that's disturbed by comorbid illnesses, and let's turn and talk for a while about a series of sleep disorders, per se, that are quite common, and I've picked these sleep disorders because they are common in older adults. And we're going to talk about sleep disordered breathing, otherwise known as sleep apnea, Restless leg syndrome, which is often called, uh, can be associated with something called periodic movement disorder or periodic uh, limb movement disorder. There are a variety of names for it. REM behavior disorder, and I'll define each of these when we get to them. And then something called irregular sleep-wake rhythm, which is a circadian rhythm disturbance, which is very commonly seen in demented patients, in individuals, say, with Alzheimer's dementia, uh, once it's advanced sufficiently, where they probably have to be institutionalized. Okay, sleep disordered breathing, let's start with that. And everybody is probably familiar now with obstructive sleep apnea. It is probably the second most common sleep disturbance behind insomnia. Uh, it does rise with age, although in men it kind of tapers off. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, possibly because the men with significant apnea die off from cardiovascular and related complications then. But interestingly, it, it, it really begins to rise in women postmenopausally. So women are not immune. It's not a male-only disorder. It's male-predominant uh, up until uh, later midlife. And then postmenopausally, women show much more sleep apnea. And they don't have to show, they don't show it the same way as men. I'm a classic example of a potential sleep apneic. Right? Heavy guy, big throat, mild hypertension, and indeed I have some mild sleep apnea. I just don't have it bad enough where it requires treatment, at least I don't think so. My, my cognitive abilities still seem reasonably intact and I haven't fallen asleep yet during the talk, so there's hope for me. But it is age-related, as I said. Uh, it, phenomenologically, it's repeated stoppages or reductions in breathing during sleep. Very often, involved with snoring. The rubric is almost all sleep apneic snore, but not all snorers necessarily have sleep apnea, because it's not snoring that's about apnea. Uh, typically, uh, an apneic will do this kind of thing. It's <laughs> and then nothing for a while, including no breathing. Nothing moves. The airway has collapsed, and the person is trying to inspire against a collapsed airway, so they can't bring air in. So they're struggling against it, but since there's no air moving, there's no noise happening. This can go on for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half in some cases. Meanwhile, blood oxygen is going down, blood CO2 is going up, blood pressure is going up, hormones are being released. And then suddenly you get a <laughs> in that pattern, which can be repeated across the night. Typically, an obstructive sleep apnea is caused by a narrowing or collapse of the soft palate or pharynx. So it's up in the airway. If you just put your hand back and try not to gag yourself, if you know you can feel where your palate gets soft beyond the bridge of your mouth. And it's that portion of the airway that can collapse. It can be exacerbated by tonsils and adenoids and things like that. It can be exacerbated by adiposity because I don't just get fat in my belly and butt, I get fat in my neck. So tissue there, okay. Um, it's associated with daytime, excessive daytime sleepiness, and there's clearly in, mo in many apneics impaired functioning. Sleep apneas are defined by what's called an apnea hypopnea index. And apnea is a complete succession of breathing. A hypopnea is a reduction of a certain amount. And the definitions vary, but uh, there are a variety of uh, ways to define the problem. Okay. Um, 
This just gives you a sense of the prevalence, depending on who you believe. Uh, there have been very high prevalences found in some populations, but it's about in 20% of older adults. Uh, in some illness conditions, it can be much higher. Uh, and it's important to suspect sleep apnea in an older adult if they're complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness. And, don't, and even if they're like a skinny little bird-like woman, right, you don't assume that they don't have apnea just because they're skinny and bird-like. They could have apnea. Because you don't know what their anatomical airway looks like based on their phenotype. What are the treatment options? Uh, well, depends on how severe it is. Positional sleeping is one option for mild cases. Most people are much more likely to be apneic when they're supine on their back because it encourages airway collapse. So you encourage them or you can train them or there are gizmos to help them sleep on their side or their belly. Um, that ranges from alarms to the old trick of tying baseball, uh, tennis balls or whatever into a sleeve in the back of the pajamas so that there's this ridge and uh, makes it uncomfortable to sleep prone. Weight loss works, but weight loss, of course, is hard to maintain. But weight loss can indeed work. Uh, there are a variety of things called MADS, uh, mandibular advancement devices. Uh, these are things that bring the lower jaw forward relative to the upper jaw. And that opens the airway. Because one of the things that happens in an apnea that can often help produce an apnea is there's the lolling of the back of the tongue. And this moves that the base of your tongue farther forward and helps maintain airway patency. Can work quite well in mild to moderate apneas, even in some cases of severe apnea. Uh, with more significant apnea, though, you want to move towards what's called the gold standard treatment. And that is positive airway pressure. We used to call it CPAP. We used to call it continuous positive airway pressure. But now we call it generically positive airway pressure because it comes in a variety of flavors. There's CPAP. There's BiPAP. There's AutoPAP. Uh, so all the machines now, and it, it's basically hooking. This sounds terrible. But think of a small, quiet vacuum cleaner running in reverse so it's blowing air out. And that goes into a face mask that the person wears. And what that does is it doesn't force inspiration. It doesn't push air in. But it allows the air sufficient pressure that you get a pneumatic splint. There's pressure that maintains the airway open. But the person breathes within that pressure range. Okay. So in BiPAP, for example, that air pressure would change regularly across the breathing cycle. With CPAP, it maintains all the time. So positive airway pressure. Uh, relatively new. It was discovered in the, 18, the 1980s, 86, actually, uh, by Sullivan in Australia. And then there have been a variety of surgeries. Uh, they can vary tremendously. Uh, some surgeries will literally uh, move the face forward, the entire face. And actually, those work fairly well. There are a lot of other surgical procedures that work simply on the airway. And they range from going in and surgically manipulating the airway to doing radio frequency ablation and causing scar tissue and things like that. Um, all of those work some of the time for some people, but none of them are complete cures. And there are oft times significant complications. So you know, surgery is not a silver bullet in this case at all. Okay. So those are the ways that one can treat apnea. And obviously, this is not something that one does in their, their own practice unless you happen to be a, a sleep specialist. But there are more and more uh, sleep clinics all over the US. A lot of them focus specifically on apnea. Uh, I could talk a lot about that as well. Uh, but uh, I'll briefly tell you at the end how you can locate clinics in your area if you're not familiar with them. And even out in our various six state catchment area, there are clinics that have popped up. Uh, and I think all of the states that we uh, reach uh, do have at least some sleep clinics. Restless leg syndrome, another age-related phenomenon. This one's actually more common in women. 
uh, it is a sensory phenomenon to people. Uh, usually affects the lower limbs, not always just the lower limbs, but typically the lower limbs. And it affects them in a circadian fashion. That is, it occurs typically around bedtime in the evening. And people describe strange sensations, like uh, pulling or searing, crawling, boring, like insects under your skin on your legs. Not pleasant. Uh, it's interesting, you can, uh, you can relieve it yourself by getting out of bed and moving around. Movement actually relieves it. Okay. But if you go quiescent again, it can return, and this interferes with your ability to go to sleep when you want to, obviously. And it sometimes gonna, can wake you up, and you're experiencing it in the evening as well. Uh, one of my favorite things, one of the self-support groups uh, of this is, they're a group called the Night Walkers. I think it's beautifully named. Um, it's relieved by movement, it delays sleep onset. It also can result in excessive daytime sleepiness and impaired daytime function. This sounds kind of funny, but it's not. If you have it, it's terrible. I'll give you a, an example, and this is a true case. It's not, not something that I was involved in, but I actually saw the video. There's an individual that has significant restless leg syndrome, and he self-treated. The way he self-treated was he had a baseball bat that he had in it by his bed. And when he was experiencing restless legs, he would pick up the bat and he'd whack himself on the lower legs because that felt better somehow than the restless leg symptoms. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, you know, that uh, electrical stimulation that you sometimes can give tens for pain. Well, you know, maybe it's, it worked for him somewhat, but you know these were not love taps either. These were significant waxes. So it just anybody willing to do that, you know that this was not a pleasant experience. Okay. It often occurs <clears throat> with uh, another related disorder called periodic limb movements during sleep. Uh, periodic limb movements again occur mostly in the lower legs, but these are what are called in the old days, and don't worry about it, but myoclonic jerks, muscle twitches, significant muscle twitches. And your, your lower legs can twitch so much that they will awaken you and awaken you repeatedly across the night. So these can occur very often together. Uh, as far as we know, uh, their uh, restless legs and possibly periodic lip movements is a metabolic disorder which involves iron metabolism because of some treatments where you, in, where you use, where you boost iron help the symptoms with some people. And that iron metabolism also seems to be related to dopaminer, dopaminergic nerves. So dopaminergic uh, treatments are also potentially effective. The way one treats, there are a variety of treatments that have been used. Uh, opiates and benzodiazepines have been used. Acetaminophen with codeine, for example, or clonazepam. Uh, but the uh, treatment of choice are the dopaminergics. And, uh, and you know, that just gives you some generic doses that people employ. Uh, but of course, you know, one would, if you're going to work in this area, this is just general guidelines. It's the kind of thing you'd want to do very carefully. And usually these people are under the care of a neurologist, probably a sleep specialist neurologist. but. Uh, a lot of sleep clinics typically have uh, a number of medical people involved, very often a pulmonary doc and often a neurologist. REM behavior disorder, another age related. This one is uh, quite common in men. Uh, the predominant patient population is male and in their 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, the kind we all think of as dream sleep, uh, one of the phenomena that occurs during REM is something called atonia. Your voluntary muscles kind of turn off and your body becomes limp. If you ever want to play with your bed partner uh, in, a, in a nice way and you want to demonstrate this, if you're ever awake and they're not in the early morning, in the morning when they're more likely to be in REM sleep, See if their eyes are moving under 
their eyelids, which means they're in REM, and then just pick up their arm, see what happens. It should be kind of rubbery. No resistance, pick it up, let it go, it goes dropping down, which wouldn't happen in the other stages where there's more muscle tone. But it's a, good, it's a loss of muscle tone that occurs during REM, and in evolutionary terms, it's been assumed that that's so we don't act out our dreams. Well, what happens in REM behavior disorder is people act out their dreams. They lose this atonia. And as a result, uh, they thrash. If their dreams have violent contact, they may respond to those, so they may lash out. Uh, can jump out of bed sometimes and uh, run or trip or kick things. Uh, this is dangerous to the individual, and it's dangerous to the bed partner. Bed partners have been severely hurt when the person transfers the dream imagery to the person that's in the bed next to them. So, again, this sounds weird, but it's not fun. Interestingly, there's an acute form of this that follows alcohol withdrawal, which is very similar, uh, or drug, various sedative drug intoxications. Uh, there's data to suggest that it may be an early manifestation of Parkinson's. A lot of these people go on to develop full-blown Parkinson's disease, uh, possibly because the underlying neurological structures are similar. Uh, although the treatment of choice here is not dopaminergic, the treatment of choice is clonazepam, which is a, a benzodiazepine, and it works very well. It controls both the behavior and the dream components of the disorder, uh, and it's effective immediately for both acute and chronic. REM behavior disorder. So again, we have, a, we have an effective treatment. But again, this would be the kind of thing that you would have to have diagnosed at a sleep clinic and treated more than likely by a sleep specialist who's, who would typically be a neurologist in this case. Irregular sleep-wake rhythm. There are a variety of circadian rhythm disorders. That is, not problems with sleep per se, but when sleep occurs and how it occurs and appears across the 24-hour uh, clock. Most of us sleep in a single bout, but that's not true necessarily. Everywhere, culturally, sometimes people sleep with a, a secondary bout of sleep, the siesta. And certainly, uh, growing up, all of us have polyphasic sleep. You know, when you're a little munchkin, you're sleeping and waking up to cry and eat, and then going back to sleep, and then waking up to cry and eat, and you do that around the clock, much to your parents' chagrin. Uh, but that gradually changes, and we have... Uh, you know, a more poly, a monophasic sleep. Although, interestingly, uh, there's some anthropologists that have studied sleep patterns before the electric light. And it suggests that uh, before the electric light, people didn't necessarily sleep in the, in the bout we did. But because darkness was longer than simply eight hours, they often went to sleep for a while, woke up in the middle of the night. Maybe they talked, did whatever, and then slept a while longer. So they became biphasic. But that's not what this is about. What irregular sleep-wake rhythm is about is the relative lack of circadian pattern to the sleep-wake cycle. It's almost as if sleep was randomly distributed around the 24-hour period. Um, there are lots of things that can contribute to this, but it's most associated with neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, when an Alzheimer's patient uh, is moderate and approaching severe stages, very often uh, you see this kind of pattern, so that they'll only be sleeping three or four hours at night, and then the rest of it will be scattered around during the day. Uh, very difficult for their caregivers, as you would imagine. Uh, and indeed, in those individuals, there's suggestion that there's damage to the circadian pacemaker, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that actually provides the timing of when sleep should occur. Uh, you can't really fix it. You can kind of ameliorate it and make it as less bad as it can be. Uh, and that's usually done with timed light uh, and with uh, mixed modal therapies, a lot of them environmental. Uh, they've tried it with mel tried melatonin trials, and seemingly melatonin trials have not been effective. Although we may be doing it wrong. And so people are still pursuing that grail. Okay, so that's age-related sleep change, 
comorbid illnesses, primary sleep disorders. We've still got this other thing going on, uh, which can be bad sleep habits, can also be insomnia. And that's where I want to turn now, is to talk about that. Some sleep changes are a normal part of aging, and education is key, as we've talked about before. If a sleep disturbance is comorbid with an illness, I've said treat both, right? And if you have a primary sleep disorder, you want to treat that sleep disorder directly. But there are situations where a sleep disturbance isn't wholly the result of sleep change or health burden or primary health, uh, primary physical or mental illness, right? Their sleep disruption is likely to be maintained by the development of poor sleep habits, conditioned emotional responses, learning, potentially. Uh, some would argue with insomnia, uh, there's an arousal, there's a physiological arousal. The brain is like working on overtime, as it were. Uh, and such the sleep, sleep disturbances can occur either purely by themselves or very often in association with comorbid illnesses. So this is the stuff of insomnia, and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture. Uh, talking considerably about insomnia, but also talking quite a bit about interventions for insomnia and focusing on behavioral interventions that can be applied uh, by the, your average healthcare worker if they're so inclined, not a specialist. Okay, so what's the new DSM-5 criteria for insomnia disorder? Because it is relatively new. It's a predominant complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep quality, quantity, and accompanied by one or more of the following symptoms. Difficulties initiating sleep, that is, it takes too long for me to fall asleep. Difficulty maintaining sleep characterized by frequent awakenings or problems returning to sleep after awakening. So it's not just really awakening, but it's having difficulty getting back to sleep. All of us awaken during the night, sometime. Uh, as we get older, a lot of us have to do the bathroom break in the middle of the night. That's, you know, that's annoying, but it's not crippling. But it's if you had to take the bathroom break and it takes you 45 minutes to get back to sleep, that's when you start having a problem, feeling impaired and complaining about it. And that's when you're talking about insomnia, potentially. There's also waking up earlier than you would like and being unable to go back to sleep as well. That can easily be confused with the circadian rhythm disorder, but that's for differential diagnosis. Just something to think about. There used to be a fourth complaint, non-refreshing sleep, but that seemed too generic and has been dropped. It used to occur in the old definitions. It's not there anymore. In addition to one of these complaints, the difficulty has to cause significant distress or impairment in daytime function. And really, this is all by self-report. The person has to report they've got a nighttime problem that fits these criteria, and it's impacting their life during the day. And there is no acid test for insomnia. It's really a, a diagnosis by self-report, as is depression and a lot of other illnesses that are quite significant. The sleep difficulty has to occur at least three nights a week on average. We didn't have that level of definition previously. We didn't talk about frequency. And the sleep difficulty has to be present for at least three months, so it has to be fairly chronic. We also didn't have that. That's new in these definitions. And this last is very important. The sleep difficulty has to occur despite adequate opportunity to sleep. Because if someone says, I'm not sleeping well, and it's impacting my daily life. And you find out they're working four jobs. And they leave themselves four hours to sleep. That's not insomnia. That's a, another whole problem. Okay. It's like I gave a lecture not too long ago in the area on seasonal affective disorder. And I mentioned that the easiest cure for seasonal affective disorder is relocation. Go to a sunny climb. Yeah, well, the easiest cure for that is give up two of the jobs, but, you know, some people can't necessarily do that, so. But it's not insomnia, and it has to be treated differently if you discover it. 
The sleep difficulty is not better explained by and does not occur exclusively during the course of another sleep-wake disorder. So it's not secondary to sleep apnea or restless legs or you have to rule those out. Right? But most of those are easily ruled out because you can describe the symptoms. The sleep disorder is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance. So it's not the result of addiction or substance abuse or medication for that matter. Somebody could in come in and I, <laughs> I've been around this business so long I have an anecdote for almost everything. Uh, I, I, it just popped back into my head that years ago I got a call from somebody over at Children's Hospital that they were treating a young child for uh, asthma and that the child had suddenly developed severe insomnia. And they said, oh, okay, um, treating him for asthma. Have you changed the treatment lately? And I swear to God, the individual told me, yes, we just put them on Theodore. Theodore, it turns out, is long-acting theophylline, which is a respiratory stimulant. But it's a xanthine. It's the neighbor of caffeine, right? And it has CNS effects too. It's just not predominantly a CNS drug. It's more a respiratory drug, but it does have the CNS effects. So I said, I'm just going to guess that maybe they're sensitive to the Theodore and you're getting cognitive, you know, CNS arousal. So you might want to try changing the dose, lowering the dose, going back to the other drug, giving it in the morning, not in the evening, you know. See what happens. Yeah. And I wouldn't be telling you this, of course, if it wasn't a miracle cure. Right? So, but, uh, but the idea is medications. <laughs> Coexisting medical mental order, uh, disorders and medical conditions that do not adequately explain the predominant complaint of insomnia. That is that they don't necessarily operate in sync. Gee, doc, yeah, Doc, I'm depressed once in a while. When I'm depressed, my, my, you know, I really can't sleep. But when I'm not depressed, I'm fine. Well, that suggests that it's not truly an insomnia per se, but he's probably depressed. Uh, so things like that. You have to be aware of how things line up or don't line up. Okay, so what's the treatment strategy for someone who has a chronic insomnia? And I want to point out that this is not my personal formula. This was first developed by the NIH uh, state-of-the-art consensus conference on sleep in 2005 that I was part of. This was a gathering of sleep gurus that were trying to do state-of-the-art treatment advice. And this was stated then, and it still holds. And it's important to spend some time on this slide because it's antithetical to the way insomnia is often treated in the healthcare community because it's easier to reach for the prescription pad than to do things that involve more than reaching for the prescription pad. First and foremost, useful in almost all cases, even if you were to write a prescription, is a careful review and optimizing of a patient's sleep hygiene habits and practices. And I'll talk about that. Second, not going to prescriptions yet, second would be referral to more formal cognitive behavioral interventions as appropriate. And I'll talk about what those cognitive behavioral interventions are and some of the issues around them. Third, and only third, is judicious use of appropriate hypnotics in association with cognitive behavioral techniques or alone may be helpful. So if the behavioral stuff doesn't work first, then the pharmacological stuff should proceed. Unfortunately for uh, a lot of individuals, a lot of physicians, they do the opposite. And I'm not saying that they should do all the work that's involved in doing the behavioral stuff. I'm saying that just like anything else, they should be, they should, they should have a referral network if possible that would allow them to send the patient and give the patient a choice so that these other things could be employed before necessarily prescribing a drug. And this is no different than somebody comes in hypertensive and obese, and the first thing you should do is suggest diet and exercise. Let's try it, diet and exercise for a while before pharmacological intervention. 
and, and you see if it works or if the person's capable of it or how well it works, and then you add the drugs later. It's analogous. So I'm not preaching an odd thing here. I'm simply saying it applies in the sleep and insomnia world too. Well, the first thing you need to do is you want to be sure that the person understands, that their understanding of sleep is reasonable, that they don't have weird ideas about sleep. Like, if I don't get a good night's sleep, I'm going to die. We all know that that's an irrational belief, but some people can hold it. Right? So you want to educate people. You want to give them fact-based information about sleep. And very often, uh, you can get brochures from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine or the National Sleep Foundation or the NIA, the National Institute on Aging, that provide this kind of informa information in a packet that can be left in the waiting room and, or people can refer to it if sleep comes up as an issue during an exam. People need to know what's normal sleep for a given age because any older adult that expects themselves to be sleeping uh, eight to ten hours a night during, you know, in their older years is physiologically wrong. There, we know from looking at the populations that that anticipation is setting themselves up to be unhappy. And they need to be educated that on average, older adults that are functioning well in the community, when I say older, I'm talking, you know, 70, 75, 80 year olds, uh, are functioning well on seven hours sleep. That's seven hours sleep, you know, and you got to be careful about how much time that people spend in bed, which is another whole thing. Remember, I already mentioned bed rest as a problem. Uh, and people need to know what the consequences of mild sleep loss are, you know, that it's not going to debilitate them, that they can stand it a little bit, and they have to recognize what's appropriate and what's not. You have to address erroneous assumptions and misconceptions about dysfunctional beliefs. And so, you know, need to explore that a little bit with people, because sometimes people can have the wildest ideas about sleep. You can log their data. You can ask them to keep a sleep log. Don't just go by people's sense of, well, I think it was this over the last couple of weeks. Say, look, you've got a real pro you think you have a real problem? Why don't we get some hard information? Why don't you keep a sleep log for a week or two weeks and then come back and let's see what it looks like. And these diaries can vary. Sometimes they're called diaries, sometimes they can be called logs. Basically, you want to find out some information like when does a person go to sleep, when does a person wake up, how often do they think they've awakened during the night, and are there key things, do they wake and feel feeling refreshed, and are there key antecedents or consequences like uh, alcohol use or caffeine use or those types of things. And what you're doing is you're trying to look at behavioral patterns. You're trying to see, for example, do people have wildly disparate bedtimes? If a person has bedtimes that vary by three or four or five hours in a given week, they're setting themselves up to have terrible sleep. That's not the way we're designed. We're designed to have fairly regular bedtimes and fairly regular rise times. And you can learn that from a log. You can learn that from questioning them, but you have the log as objective data. You can learn if there are certain antecedents. I had a fight with my daughter. I had a terrible night's sleep that night. You know, if that kind of pattern shows, you can talk about that. Or you had too much to drink. Or, you know, you're out playing chess and drinking coffee. Because that can happen too. The nice thing about logging this stuff is a person gets to see a picture of their problem. And they may look at it and say, and if this happens, it's not as bad as I thought it was. Thanks. <laughs> or, gee, I'm doing this and I didn't realize that, you know, it's, it's only on the days that I work with the boss I hate that I'm really having problems. And then you can explore options from that. Also, if the person does try and go into some longer term treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy or even if they're using pharmacotherapy, it allows you to chart progress, see how they've improved. And so they can see that their patterns of sleep have changed. So logging is a good thing. It's just an example of it. There are tons of logs. Again, these are also things that are very often made available by uh, uh, support structures like the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and things like that. 
So let's talk briefly about these sleep hygiene habits. These are the behavioral and environmental factors that actually maximize or compromise sleep, depending on what they are. And depending on who's lecturing, you'll get slightly, vari slightly different variations on theme. This is how I uh, do them. Uh, I could probably change it around a little bit, but I'm an old dog set in his ways in this case. So, And it covers the ground. And these are sleep-wake principles, environmental principles, diet and drug use principles, and the catch-all general. So let's go through them briefly. The single best thing you can do to sleep well is to maintain a regular bed and rise time. And if you're only going to do one of those, maintain a regular rise time. Why do I say that? Anybody want to venture a guess here in the audience? My, my live audience? Well, it's not easier to control necessarily, but what it does do is it forces you to be either tired or more tired or less tired the next night. If I always get, let's say I have, I go to bed later than I usually want to. Okay. And I have to, and I get myself up at a rise time. Instead of allowing myself to sleep three hours longer, I get up at the usual rise time. It's going to be I'm more likely to fall asleep well that night. Whereas if you, if you go to bed three hours late and you say, since I went to bed three hours later, I'm going to get up three hours later in the morning, that means you're more likely to go to bed three hours later that night and move your sleep around the clock in a bad way. But if you always get up at roughly, and I'm not saying you know, to the minute, but you always get up at roughly the same time within an hour across weeks, a given hour, then you're much more likely to maintain quality sleep. Otherwise, you get, you guys know what Monday morning cars are? It's an old expression from the Detroit days. Here's what happens when you're an auto worker, right? Friday comes along. You go out drinking with the guys. You don't go to bed until 1 or 2 in the morning instead of 10 or 11. And then Saturday comes around, and what do you do? You go out drinking with the guys again. But you probably slept in on Saturday morning, and so you stay up drinking with the guys later. So now it's Sunday, and you're going to bed very late, and what happens? Monday morning, you've got to be back on the line to make cars. So the old joke is you didn't want a car made on Monday because you've got sleep-deprived workers, right? Because all of us have a tendency for our circadian clocks to move forward in time. It's the easiest way to keep them set. So a regular rise time is very, very useful. Potentially restrict time in bed. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that when people aren't sleeping well, they think, if I spend more time in bed, I'll sleep better. But actually, as I told you, from bed rest, we know that spending too much time in bed is actually bad for your sleep quality. It breaks it up. You're better off sleeping a shorter period of time and sleeping more of that time than lying in bed hoping you'll sleep more. Because your sleep really is physiologically driven, and it's not going to stretch out to fill a longer period of time if you don't have sufficient sleep need. So you stay in bed only as long as you're asleep. You don't want to diddle around in bed. Explore the usefulness of napping. This is where I differ from a lot of my colleagues. People a lot of times say, shouldn't nap. If you're treating insomnia forcefully, as I'll say using cognitive behavioral therapy, yes, you shouldn't nap. But if you're just exploring sleep habits and hygiene, in most people, I say you got to explore a nap. you got to see whether it's useful or not. Okay, it may be useful to get you a little powered through the second half of the day, especially in much older adults. But if you get annoyed because when you nap, you sleep a little shorter at night you know, because you've robbed Peter to pay Paul, don't get upset. Recognize that you have a limited sleep need, and depending on how you fill it, Uh, there's also, although there's a little controversy about that, but I won't, I, I still think it, it holds that you have to explore whether naps are useful, regardless of whether they impact sleep need or not. Environmental principles. Ensure the bedroom is sufficiently dark. You know, in Seattle, that's not that much of a problem, especially in winter, but regardless. Minimize disturbing noise, if you can. 
ensure bedding temperature airflow are consistent with good quality sleep. You know, this it's not rocket science, but it's important. So another little phone call I got one time from this was a, a layperson reached me through the university because you know you look up University of Washington Vidiello University of Washington and sleep you get me more often than not, um, and they called it said they were experiencing some insomnia uh, and. Uh, well, look, and so I started to talk to them. And we went through a whole bunch of stuff. And I started to talk about sleep habits, and I started to talk about environment. I said, has anything changed in your sleep environment lately? And they said, well, we got some new pillows a while ago. I said, oh, new pillows. Uh, how long you said you got this problem? Oh, I don't know, a month, two months. How long you had the pillows? Oh, maybe two or three months, I don't know. Is it interesting? You have the old pillows? Yeah. Let's do an experiment. Get out the old pillows, try them for a week, call me back, let me know how things are. Now again, I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't a miracle cure. <laughs> uh, and it was a miracle cure. It went something like this. They bought new pillows, they were goose down. Well, this person probably had an allergy to goose down, and so they would go to sleep and their airway would start to block. They would experience probably some sleep apnea and they're reporting it as insomnia because they're tired during the day and things like that. So, um, so bedding, stuff like that, it's really important. Uh, night lights, you know, with older adults uh, where there's mobility problems and things like that, night lights are good. Uh, but night lights should always be used so that the light is on the ground and not up in the atmosphere because people are sensitive to light and it can be arousing. It can offset their circadian rhythms. So one of the things um, that you uh, want to be careful of is the need to throw on bright lights in the middle of the night. You want to avoid bright light in the middle of the night and night lights can help that. Just saw this new thing for, uh, there's a little gizmo that you hang on the side of your toilet that illuminates your toilet at night in a variety of colors, color choices. But I mean, it, it's something similar to this, I and mean, it's not quite as crazy as the Japanese toilets, which if any of you have ever had that experience, it's wild. Uh, so lighting, right? Uh, eliminator placed bedroom clocks so they're not viewed from the bed. Why do you need to know when you wake up in the middle of the night that it's 3.15? You don't, unless you have to get up. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But what does that do? It sets up your brain starts going, I'm awake. I don't want to be awake. How long, much longer do I have to sleep? All you need to alarms work whether you can see the numbers or not, right? The sound goes off. My wife, who's a professional sleeper, by the way, she's she really is a very sound sleeper, found this clock. I don't know where she found it, but it projects on the ceiling in large red numbers the time. So you don't even have to turn. You can open your eyes when you're unhappily awake in the middle of the night and know just what time it is and become annoyed and therefore less likely to fall asleep. And the thing is that we're terrible about knowing when we're asleep and not asleep. And so it's conceivable that someone can have the following experience. Their eyes pop open, they, they do the my wife clock, and they see, oh, it's 2.42. Damn, I'm awake. Now I know I'm going to be awake a long time. But in reality, they fall asleep fairly soon. But then they wake up again 20 or 30 minutes later, and they look up, and they're convinced they've been awake that entire time, even though they haven't. And what happens is they get the angst. In my Italian nature, it's a thing called agita, right? Your stomach is going like this. And you're unhappy, and you're anxious, and that doesn't facilitate good sleep. Basically, you've got physiological arousal. Your sympathetic system is starting to pump. And you don't want that in the middle of the night. Okay, so turn the clocks around. Now, again, this is only if you have problems sleeping. If the clock doesn't bother you and you go right back to sleep, muzzle top. Diet and drug use principles. This is a no-brainer, too. No pepperoni pizzas at midnight in the bedroom. You're no longer a college student. Well, maybe some of you are. But, uh, you know, that's not good. Not good. Explore the usefulness of light bedtime snacks. There are snacks that are actually soporific that 
contains significant amounts of tryptophan, which is an amino acid that's a precursor of the sleep hormones that help us sleep. Uh, they're listed here. Some of them are listed here. Milk, bananas, turkey, cheese, peanut butter. So you could, you know, have a uh, turkey, cheese, peanut butter sandwich with bananas and warm milk. Should knock you right out. But uh, there, no, there is a reason why we all kind of do this on Thanksgiving. It's not just the amount of food, but it's that turkey, too. It's very high in tryptophan. Avoid social drugs that are potentially stimulating. This is, again, not rocket science. And, you know, don't, uh, oh, I, I don't drink coffee. I just drink tea. Yeah, well, what kind? And, you know, some teas are quite, quite stimulating. So you have to be careful there. There used to be this tea brand called Morning Thunder. It had a bug-eyed buffalo on the front to it. So that's not, even though it was tea, it was a very high caffeinated tea. It's not the kind of thing you'd want to drink. Uh, be aware that OC, OTC and prescription medications can adversely affect sleep as well. So, you know, if you're someone whose sleep is sensitive, whenever your physician is prescribing you something new, you want to maybe talk about that. Because, for example, I always take my diuretic in the morning. Why would I want to take it before I go to sleep? Why should I increase the likelihood of me having to get up to urinate when, I, when it's perfectly fine doing it in the morning? So depending if there's flexibility on dosing and timing, you should explore that, especially if you're sensitive to these things. Uh, sorry, ooh, I'm not, I didn't use that, so let's get rid of that. Ah. General principles. Again, this kind of pulls it all together. Uh, know what's normal and age appropriate for sleep patterns. Explore if the bedroom habits disturb sleep. Do you have Bedroom, do you pay your bills in the bed? You know, do you watch endless television in the bed? Basically, you want to develop relaxing bedtime rituals. Um, reading is an excellent example. I read in bed. I read in bed maybe two pages if I'm lucky. Because I have the book, I start to read, and the book comes down, and that's a signal to put the book over and turn off the light. But if you're a mystery junkie and the mystery book club just sent you the new one and you lie in bed and you're avidly reading, this is not a good bedtime ritual, right? You want to come up with something more boring, more mundane, more relaxing. I don't know, slow, slow flossing your teeth, uh, whatever works. Um, sleep is not, well, the bedroom is not the place to worry. You know, there are people that go over everything bad that happened to them that day, anticipate all the bad things that will happen to them the next day, and then wonder why they're not sleeping well when they're using the bedroom as worry time. Well, they're doing several things. One is they're teaching themselves that the bedroom predicts worry, and they're also probably stimulating their sympathetic nervous system to generate a little adrenal action and, you know, arousal, and that's not helping either. So you can schedule regular worry time. Some people, you can keep a pad by your bed. There's something that worries you, you write it down, it's captured, and then you have a certain time during the day when you go over that stuff. It's just a potential strategy. Exercise regularly and moderately, of course, spend time in outdoor light, even if it is Seattle, uh, and avoid bright light during the night. So those are the general principles. So those are uh, kind of the, the things that one needs to explore because you can do these correctly or you can do these wrongly, every one of these, and all of them can have impact on sleep quality. All right, before I talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is really the gold standard treatment for sleep, for insomnia, excuse me, I will talk briefly about pharmacological treatment approaches, very briefly. I'm going to tell you what they are. And that's about it. I'm going to tell you whether they're good or bad and how one should think about them. Well, we won't even start with the, with the barbiturates anymore, although we still occasionally find an 85-year-old person who's still on barbiturates, even though they're you know, bad drugs and they're actually used for euthanasia. Um, benzodiazepines are still out there, uh, and they're still used, although uh, very rarely now. Uh, the benzodiazepine receptor agonists have been the big ones that we've seen since the 80s uh, that most people 
uh, are typically treated with. There was and still is, although I'm not sure it's still available in the U.S., but there was for a while a melatonin agonist that uh, wasn't as efficacious, really, as the BZRAs. Within the last few years, uh, two new culprits on the horizon. One is a low dose of an antidepressant that's been around forever. Uh, it's a very, very low dose compared to the psychiatric doses, and it seems to be, there's some evidence to suggest that it works, and it doesn't have the respiratory problems potential of that uh, the BZRAs have. And a new, brand new drug using a whole different transmitter system. This is a transmitter system that was discovered to be likely the cause of uh, narcolepsy in individuals. And it's basically not a sleep-producing compound like most sedatives. It is a, it's an arousal-decreasing compound. So it lowers your body's arousal, allowing you to sleep. It's pretty much brand new on the market. We don't know much about it yet. And then there are lots of other things out there. There are all the OTCs, melatonin, which, by the way, there's no good evidence that, that melatonin is good for insomnia. It's good for jet lag. It's good for circadian rhythm disorders of certain types. But there are really no strong trials that it's good for insomnia. Um, there are the herbal compounds like valerian. Uh, most OTCs use an antihistamine, which is problematic in older adults anyway. And actually, the American Geriatric Society strongly recommends against it. Uh, prescription medications that are off-label, uh, off like the antipsychotics and antidepressants are sometimes used, particularly in, uh, in uh, assisted living environments, in nursing home environments, although that's changed. Uh, the federal government has made a, uh, a large effort to discourage that and just recently published data that it's down about 15 or 20 percent nationwide. Uh, unfortunately, Washington is not down along with the nation, where it's still at about the same level. Didn't permeate properly here. Maybe it will. Uh, and then there are a number of uh, other compounds that are in development. So these are the pharmacological drugs that are available. Uh, Oops, I'm sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing. Uh, as I've said, the BZRAs are efficacious. They've got relatively good safety profiles, certainly compared to the old barbiturates, uh, but they're not without some side effects, uh, and one has to be worried about them. Uh, reasonable, reasonably demonstrated efficacy in the intermediate term and safety in the intermediate term, but not really that much long-term data. Uh, melatonin and the other compounds, uh, much less data available, newer kids on the block. It's hard to say about those. So what are the caveats concerning drug treatment? First of all, is insomnia transient or chronic? Pharmac pharmacotherapy probably is better during a transient insomnia, situational insomnia, than a chronic insomnia. Uh, at least that's my bias. I'm not sure you want to medicate someone for life with a sedative drug, necessarily, unless you have other choices. What's the nature of the sleep complaint? You know, is it sleep onset problems? Is it sleep maintenance problems? Uh, you'd have to choose your drug then, because you want a fast-acting drug if it's sleep onset. You'd want a short-acting drug if it's sleep onset. If it's sleep maintenance, you don't mind if the drug is slower onset and longer acting. Right? So you'd have to pick the profile. So does the drug's profile of action match the patient's complaint? That's certainly something that one would consider. And then, of course, the most important thing to consider, what are the drug's likely side effects? Because uh, most sedative drugs have significant side effects. And oh, and I should point out that even that newest drug uh, that's based on the orexin hypocretin uh, system is a Schedule IV drug, because there's abuse potential there. So a lot of these drugs are also uh, abuse potential. And then, of course, there are the side effects like psychomotor impairment, cognitive impairment, daytime carryover sedation, respiratory depression, and rebound insomnia. One has to consider whether these are the case. They're not the case for all the compounds, but they're the case for some of the compounds, and these are the things that one would have to look at. And if you're looking at older adults where there may already be some cognitive compromise and some psychomotor difficulties, uh, 
and they may be more prone to respiratory depression, you may be swimming up the wrong stream when using these compounds. Which brings us to my last topic, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Uh, it is not a single thing. It is a armamentarium, kind of a, a quiver of arrows that one can fire at insomnia. And exactly how many arrows and how long they are vary from practitioner to practitioner, but most, if not all, CBT protocols involved reviewing sleep hygiene and education, using a sleep log, and then two, two powerful techniques that all of the meta-analyses that have been done suggest is where the biggest bang is. Something called stimulus control therapy that I'll talk about and sleep restriction therapy that I'll also talk about. CBTI can also contain relaxation techniques and can also contain cognitive restructuring techniques, but not necessarily. There are a lot of practitioners that use a more behavioral approach, even though they still call it CBTI, but it's kind of like a little C, big B, TI, and, and they're the ones that are on top. Uh, others favor a more cognitive approach, so it varies with practitioners, as any treatment would. First thing I want to show you is this complex slide. This is the toughest slide you have to see today. Uh, the bottom line message is that the relative efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy is at least as good, at least as good as the pharmacological therapies. And that is that holds, uh, even though this data is somewhat old and probably these were mostly uh, BZRAs. Uh, but uh, these are effect sizes, so in some cases, CBT is better, in some cases just comparable, in some cases not as good. Um, CBT doesn't necessarily improve total sleep time, but it fixes just about everything else. Uh, and that, that holds. This is the short-term data. Uh, there's been consistent long-term data that shows that actually CBT is better in the long term than pharmacotherapy. The first, let's always oh, going to tell you about stimulus control therapy. Bottom line is this is predicated on the idea that people learn that the sleep environment produces or predicts arousal and non-sleep. And so what you do is you train them that the sleep environment predicts sleep. You develop a pre-bred ritual, as we talked about. You want to maintain a consistent rise time. Uh, you don't nap under this treatment while you're doing this treatment. Uh, you go to bed only when sleepy, even though you're maintaining a consistent rise time. If you're not, if you don't fall asleep within a certain period of time, usually it's 10 or 15 minutes, you get up. You get out of the environment, you go somewhere else, quiet, and you do some quiet activity until you feel sleepy, and then you go back to bed. And you repeat that until you fall asleep. Now, you may do that a lot the first few nights if you have a real insomnia that has sleep onset components. But what you're doing is slowly building up sleep debt and getting more and more sleepy. And you're more likely then to fall asleep over time. But what you're doing, again, is predicting it, it's that you're using the bedroom only for sleep and sex and not for everything else. And it slowly becomes a stimulus for sleep. And this has been shown to be pretty effective and has been around the longest. It was actually the first behavioral technique by Bootson back in the late 70s. There's sleep restriction therapy, which is a terrible name. It's actually time in bed restriction. You're not restricting sleep, you're restricting time in bed. You determine a person's average time of sleep. You use that with the log. And then you set roughly their bedtime to their sleep time. And you maintain a consistent wake time and you have no naps. And then what you do is, as a person sleeps that full amount, about 90% of the time that they're allowed to, stay, to go to bed, then you can gradually expand the time because their sleep will fill it a bit. But what you're doing is you're setting up a big sleep debt right at the beginning because they won't be able to sleep quite the way they'd like to sleep. But over time, that sleep debt allows you to extend their sleep time. Now, you can't go out too long. So, you know, this is no way to train people to sleep 10 hours. But if someone's reporting that they only sleep five hours, 
you can gradually change their sleep so it's more consolidated and deeper and more likely to start to approach what the population norm would be. And the thing is that even with small differences in measured sleep, a lot of times insomniacs report feeling much better and report that this is working for them. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily get to 95% sleep time, a sleep efficiency of an eight hour time in bed, It'd be less than that. And again, as I said, the meta analyses that have looked at the various components that are used in CBTI uh, typically report that stimulus control and sleep restriction are the two biggies. So I'm not going to go into the others. Just briefly, uh, this was the seminal work that really brought CBTI to the fore. Charles uh, Morin from Laval Haas uh, University up in Quebec published this in JAMA at uh, 1999. Uh, CBTI compared with pharmacotherapy for late life insomnia, just the thing we're talking about here. Uh, CBT and pharmacotherapy were both effective and com uh, comparable in the short term. CBT was rated more effective than drug therapy by subjects and significant others regardless, but the sleep improvements were better sustained by CBT over a two-year follow-up than the drug, uh, drug condition. And this impact of CBT long-term has been shown in study after study after study. This is one of my favorite studies. This was done by Kevin Morgan in England where they've got the National Health Service and they're able to look at healthcare utilization costs. He used CBTI in a bunch of sedative treated insomniacs and showed that uh, if you used CBTI, large numbers of these individuals would discontinue their drug use. And as a result, they would save about uh, three, they, he developed this thing, 3,400 um, pounds sterling. It's about $5,000 a patient a year by spending about $200 to train them with CBTI. This is the old idea that I like to talk about. You know, you give a man a fish, he eats for one day. You teach a man CBTI, he sleeps for a lifetime. <laughs> to mix the metaphor, sorry. Um, recent meta-analyses I want to tell you about briefly, because it really summarizes all the data nicely. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Chronic Insomnia, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine in this last year. 20 studies, uh, 1,200 patients. They reported sleep onset latency improved by 19 minutes. That is, it shortened their time to fall asleep by 19 minutes. Wasso or wake after sleep onset, wake during the night, improved by 26 minutes. Total bedtime improved by eight minutes, again, no reason to, for sleep to increase, it's just how it occurs. Uh, and sleep efficiency improved by almost 10%. So these are pretty big changes. The changes were sustained at later time points, no adverse outcomes were reported, and CBTI was effective for treatment in adults with chronic insomnia. This was just plain chronic insomnia, pure chronic insomnia. What about comorbid illnesses? See that my next slide, let's see. Uh, well, this just shows a bunch of data that CBTI improves comorbid insomnia in a variety of populations. So this is data that would have been subsumed in that meta-analysis. I'm not going to go through it in detail. This other study looked at cognitive behavioral therapy in persons with comorbid insomnia. So what about getting, what does CBTI do for sleep when there's comorbid illnesses on board? Basically, it does the same thing. It fixes sleep. And if you look at the numbers, it's interesting. 20-minute reduction in sleep onset latency and a 20-minute reduction in WASO and about a 9% improvement in sleep efficiency. So even in the face of all these comorbid illnesses, CBTI is having a great effect on sleep. And again, the treatments were durable up to 18 months. But remember, I also told you that there's some evidence to suggest that if you treat sleep in the face of comorbid illnesses, you may improve the comorbid illness. Funny, I should have a meta-analysis that just came out that shows exactly that. This just came out in JAMA about a year ago. 37 studies, 
2,200 patients. Effect sizes were medium to large for most sleep parameters. So yes, sleep is great. Comorbid outcomes yielded smaller effect sizes, but nonetheless significant effect sizes. Now you got to realize that these are a lot of different illnesses, and how do you measure the impact on the illness? And uh, so there's a lot of variability in there. But even so, with all that noise, the signal was still coming through, which suggested that if you have an illness and an insomnia, and if you treat just the insomnia, that you may actually help the illness, comorbid illness. So I thought that was nice that I could have that, because I used to have to display it with singleton studies, but now I have these fairly powerful meta-analyses that really crunch the numbers across huge numbers of subjects. So it's great. So what are the take-home messages? I'm sorry I'm going long here, but just fewer questions. Um, sleep disturbance in aging commonly results from multiple causes. Sleep may be significantly disturbed even in healthy, optimally aging elderly, but typically they don't complain. Education is frequently helpful in those cases if somebody does complain. But you should never assume that a sleep complaint in an older adult is merely the result of getting older, because it isn't. There's lots of reasons why sleep can be disturbed in older adults that has nothing to do with age. Sleep disturbance, comorbid with health burden, you want to treat both the illness and the sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance by a primary sleep disorder, you want to treat the sleep disorder directly. In almost all cases of sleep disturbance, and especially in those with no discernible cause, which is really about insomnia, um, you want to optimize sleep hygiene and then consider a CBTI. Judicious use of sleeping pills may be helpful, but it should not be the first course of action, and it should follow all the usual caveats for pharmacotherapy. Effectively treating sleep disturbance may have beneficial impact on comorbid illnesses. Certainly that data has been demonstrated for pain syndromes, depression, a number of other medical illnesses. There are effective treatments for most sleep disturbances in older adults. I've already described a variety of them for the other illnesses, and we now saw them for insomnia at the end of the lecture. What's important is accurate differential diagnosis and appropriate and iterative treatment, not just a one-size, one-fix. Uh, they're essential for effective treatment. The ultimate take-home message I hope you take back is growing older does not mean sleeping poorly, and we can fix things. And I also hope that, by God for a minute, it suddenly all made sense to you. <laughs> Just to leave you with a few more uh, important web resources, this is a sleep education website that's really good. This is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine if you want to locate a clinic in your area. Uh, the, the National Sleep Foundation is also a great source of information and materials. And then there, is, there are a number of on-site, uh, of internet uh, CBT sites. This is one of them. Another one is a site called Sleepio, S-L-E-E-P-I-O. Uh, I get no kickback from any of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, totally out there for your benefit. So uh, I thank you all, and I'll answer questions for this short time I've left. So I'm sorry I went so long, but I hope that it was useful. Yes, please. Do you, like, make up for sleep yet that you have to go the future, or is that kind of Yeah, the question, can we make up for sleep debt? Um, it's a difficult question. In an absolute sense, the data in healthy normals, when they have them accrue a long-term debt and then let them sleep back, you never get it all back, but you certainly recover and sleep more than you would normally for a while. So, yeah, you do recover it, but whether it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, like balancing a bank book, uh, it, the data doesn't suggest it is. But maybe the brain is plastic enough to absorb that. We don't know. If there's residual long-term bad, we don't know that. So, Michael, I'll read you the chat questions. Sure. Um, there are several sleep tracker smartphone apps, Sleep 101, Sense, Sleep better, any value of applying sleep efficiency numbers to treatment strategies? Um, there are lots of these things out there, Fitbit, all that stuff. Uh, I don't know of any of the commercial products that have been validated against polysomnography. Uh, they may or may not, depending on their accuracy, be useful in guiding strategies. 
uh, the guidelines for diagnosis of, diagnosis of insomnia don't require polysomnography. It's all self-report. So utilizing uh, questionnaires and logs is certainly efficacious in the way CBT is typically used in treatment. So uh, I couldn't comment on any of the products per se, but I do know with fair certainty that I don't know of any that have been reported as really having uh, been tested against the gold standard for measuring sleep. There's a question behind, and then I'll go out. Okay, uh, the question is uh, someone who's blind and elderly. Uh, certainly you'd want to do sleep hygiene, although the light thing doesn't apply. Uh, there is now available uh, a melatonin-like compound that's been tested to look at what's called non-24, uh, if that person is experiencing that. Uh, but before going to pharmacotherapy again, I, I would first look into uh, a lot of these more behavioral techniques because a lot of them don't require being sighted. Um, when should a person stop watching TV or using computer iPad prior to going to bed? Uh, that's an individual uh, difference kind of question. The first thing I would say, and I, I want to caution everybody, if you don't feel you have a sleep problem, you don't have to worry about anything I've talked about. Uh, if you do, then you have to start thinking about it. I think the idea is to explore what works. Uh, if you find that some TV shows get you laughing too hard or you're too happy and you can't <laughs> fall asleep right after them uh, and that bothers you, then you need to change your technique. It's, it's analogous, um, really, to the uh, thing I talked about with mysteries and books. There are good ways to get sensory input, and there are bad ways. And if you find that one is interfering with your ability to go to sleep, then you have to modify it. We've got another question here, Barb, then I'll go back to you. Um, when you talked about the sleep restriction therapy, um, what's the plan to determine average time of sleep? Is, is that just by their experience? Uh, the question for sleep restriction therapy is how we determine their time of sleep. And yes, we use the logs. We use logs. Typically, we ask people to log for at least two weeks to get the first es estimate, and then we base their average sleep time on their log data. We, we also look at the amount of time they say they spend in bed. Usually, they spend a lot more time in bed than they say they, res than they spend asleep, and what we do is we truncate the bedtime to more accurately match their self-reported sleep time, and then we use logs to assess progress over time. Weekly logs, usually. Barb? Are OTC sleep aids effective, um, and what are the cautions for their use? Uh, almost all OTC sleep aids are based on antihistamines. Uh, there, there is only a little bit of data on their acute efficacy, and they do work acutely. They are only recommended for acute use. So any chronic use goes against recommendations. Uh, and indeed, uh, the American Geriatric Society and the Beers criteria recommend against their use for chronic use at all, uh, partially because they're dirty, they're not clean antihistamines, and so uh, there are cholinergic effects as well. And in older adults, uh, both antihistaminergic effects and cholinergic effects, both are potentially problematic. So for people to be chronically using uh, OTC uh, sleep aids is probably not the best approach. And, and also there's the additional confound and some of them are with acetaminophen or, you know, they may be handling the pain and it may be the pain that's the issue and not necessarily the sleep. So it's a complex issue, but uh, I can only tell you the American Geriatric Society says no. It's not just me giving this wisdom. <laughs> Maybe one more question. How does using a computer before sleep affect sleeping? Uh, well, like anything else, it's bright light is probably not the best thing uh, to have shining in your face just before you go to bed, uh, especially a lot of our screens are blue, and that's the wavelengths that uh, maximally impact uh, melatonin, and we're actually suppressing melatonin potentially and impacting the quality of sleep we have. Uh, again, I would say, 
if you don't feel you have a problem and you don't feel you have daytime compromise, then I wouldn't worry about it. But if you felt you were having trouble falling asleep, you might want to stop using the computer a little earlier. Shall we end now? But we can go on if you're willing. I'm willing to go for another five minutes. Okay, if, so... Um, they'll be signing off. They'll be voting with their connections. Do you have any advice for people who work nights and sleep during the day? Huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you don't have insomnia, <laughs> probably. <laughs> what you have is shift work disorder. And the problem there is not with working a nighttime schedule, but working a nighttime schedule and then returning to a limited degree to a daytime schedule on the days you're not working. And that's just an issue. I mean, the things to advise are, as much as possible, avoid light when it's inappropriate, get light when it is appropriate. But those two things are antithetical when you're going from the work week to, uh, to the normal week. Uh, but the best thing I can suggest to minimize problems, well, the best thing I can suggest if you can is get another job. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like curing SADS, go move to California. But if not, what you want to do is try and regulate your off hours to be as similar as they can be to your work hours so that it's easier to slide back into work. Then if you have rotating shifts, it's another whole story. <laughs> I think I know the answer to this, but can you take Benadryl and Motrin PM while on metoprolol for heart issues? I cannot answer that. I do not know. I am a psychologist. I am sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say don't take Benadryl if it's an older adult because of Probably for the others, for the other reasons. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, yeah, I, I will. Yeah, the question is, uh, the individual here is working with uh, clients who uh, have traumatic brain injury, and uh, whether you can do a sleep log with them. Uh, it's hard to answer that without knowing the, the nature of their cognitive impairment. I think you probably can, depending on uh, their level of impairment and the simplicity of the sleep log. I, what I would do if I were trying it is I would test whether what you think they're going to interpret the sleep log is like with what they will interpret the sleep log. In other words, I'd work through it with them and get them to feed back to me what they would report in these circumstances and not assume that they're going to read it and have it the same way you would. Sure. Any more, Barb? Okay. Everybody just thanks you. Okay. Uh, one more, last one. You're good. If you want, I'll talk to you later. I've got to run, so ask me now. <laughs> ah, uh, yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy is for chronic insomnia. Uh, and would th there have been some brief treatments? I don't know of anyone who's ever done it in hospice. Uh, typically, the typical cognitive behavioral treatments last. Uh, obviously, that was the question: Can you do CBTI in hospice? Uh, the typical CBTI is six weeks of treatment, so it probably wouldn't fit that format. But you could do sleep hygiene, for example, and that might be impactful. Oh, the uh, antidepressant drugs, uh, I think, come up within about a week or two weeks. Okay, thanks all.